Well, uh, okay, so uh, it's really a great honor uh, for me to uh, uh, speak about uh, Foreign Square in front of Eli. Um, so, um, and uh, thanks for the uh, very nice introduction and for inviting me here. So, um, uh, this comes in the context of solar cells, and I think in solar cells, uh, one of the basic things that one would like to do is to absorb sunlight uh, using films that are as thin as possible. And uh, this is important if you use expensive material, then uh, use as little material as possible will reduce cost. For many of the, uh, let's say, less expensive material, uh, there are substantial issue about extracting electronic carriers, and in which case, a thinner layer allow you to extract carrier more efficiently and that improve efficiency. So in both cases, therefore, it's very important uh, to manage light in solar cell very intelligently. Uh, so in the 80s, uh, uh, when people work on crystal and silicon solar cell, and this is the thing that uh, they actually worked on, and uh, the idea comes in uh, various names. One of them is called light trapping. And on the face of it, it's a very simple idea. is to say, well, if you take a planar film and you put a mirror at the back, light will pass through this film twice in a normal distance. Uh, on the other hand, if you roughen the surface of the film, then light will come in in the normal direction when you reflect it will reflect and possibly at an angle that's larger than the total internal reflection angle, the top surface. So in that case, it will bounce through back and forth many times before it come out. And that gives you uh, quite a bit of light path enhancement and therefore absorption enhancement. So uh, uh, among many others, I think Eli uh, was among the, uh, some of the first to think about the scheme. Now, one of the very important scientific questions when you think about these schemes is, well, what's the fundamental limit of the enhancement, what's the maximum enhancement can you get, and also how do you go about getting such a maximum enhancement. And, uh, and this is where uh, the foreign square limit comes about. In 1982, uh, Eli published uh, really two uh, very, very influential paper pointing out that the maximum absorption enhanced factor is foreign square, where n is a refractive index of silicon. And so that translates into a factor of 50 for crystalline silicon, which is a very large number in enhancement factor. Uh, it also points out the, uh, uh, how do you go about reaching such a foreign square limit. And this is a work that really had great influence in solar cell optical design. So um, as someone who certainly wasn't working on solar cell in the 80s, um, I learned solar cell in the past few years starting by reading these papers. And so I'll briefly go over the basic technical argument in these papers. So uh, one of the very novel aspects of these papers is to think in a very general term about uh, optical problem in solar cell, and in particular, in thinking about the thermodynamics of light. Uh, in the starting point, imagine that you have a high index material in thermal equilibrium with a black body in vacuum then a simple calculation will show you that the intensity of light in the high index material is higher than the intensity of light outside by a factor of n score. Now, as a second step, uh, we know, of course, that sunlight is not a uh, black body in the sense that it doesn't come from every single direction. In fact, for direct sunlight, it's a highly collimated beam. Nevertheless, there's a concept of godicity. So the idea is following. Imagine that you have a rough surface, and you have light that coming only from one direction. Now, if the uh, system is agotic, once the ray enters the medium, it loses the memory of where it comes from. So in that regard, the intensity inside should be independent of the angle of instance. And so this n square relation between internal and external light should hold for directional sunlight which is actually a very interesting concept indicating what's important about the structure that one would need to design. Now, once you have this, you can put a reflector at the back and get a 2n square because light passes through the system twice. And finally, uh, one would need to translate the intensity enhancement factor of 2n square into a bulk absorption enhancement of 4n square after taking into account the geometric factors and the light path enhancement. So that's really where the uh, four and square limit uh, come from. And uh, uh, Eli actually would insist me to mention that there is a very important pre-publication correction by uh, Dr. Uh, Dick Swanson, who is going to speak after me. Um, uh, so 
this foreign score limit, uh, the understanding that there exists an upper limit, as well as many of these considerations on agadicity and on how to get to the foreign square limit, really had great influence in the optical design of crystalline silicon solar cell. Uh, the optical design of crystalline silicon cell, I'm taking a picture uh, from some of the work of Martin Green here, uh, yeah, really using ray tracing and in designing the top surface in great detail to reach precisely such a foreign square limit. So it has a, this understanding has had great influence on the commercial development of crystal silicon solar cell. In addition, this understanding also has great influence on many of the contemporary solar cell work, where instead of looking at a crystal silicon cell where the size is much larger than the wavelengths with that, then you can do ray tracing. These days, many people, including myself, are interested in uh, much smaller structures where the feature size and film thickness are on single wavelengths and sub wavelength scale and where the wave effect is important. There, of course, one can follow Eli's step, footstep, and ask what's the fundamental limit of light trapping enhancement. And uh, certainly, one can no longer use ray tracing, but the concept that's in Eli's paper turned out to be uh, really way ahead of its time in pointing out what one should think about light trapping in this wave optic limit regime. And in its very beginning, in thinking about the thermodynamics of light, uh, the argument that the intensity in the film that is higher than the intensity outside, if you do light trapping, the relation of n square can be directly derived by considering the black body radiation inside and outside and insisting on thermal equilibrium. Once you realize this, then you realize, of course, the black body radiation inside a medium is directly related to the density of state of the medium. So as a result, if you have a medium that's not a uniform bulk, it is not surprising to immediately realize that one can get a very different kind of limit. And uh, uh, so the basic concept in thinking about light trapping in the wave optics is in fact contained also in the pioneering paper of Eli in 1982. In fact, immediately after his paper, uh, uh, Ping Sheng, uh, at, uh, at, I think at the time also at Exxon, uh, has a paper that immediately follows on to argue uh, that a density of state that's different from bulk would have a different light trapping limit. And then uh, a few uh, prominent papers, for example, Stu and Hoare in 1997 uh, used the density of state perspective to calculate light trapping in a thin film waveguide. And in more recent years, ourselves and many other groups, Harry Atwater and Martin Green and many others, uh, really uh, rethink these problems in a nanophoton regime. So what we do here for the remaining uh, part of my talk is to talk about some of our own work, which builds upon Eli's work to construct a formula some to describe light trapping entirely in terms of optical modes. Now, the interesting part about these papers is that many of them actually have Eli in the acknowledgement for direct discussions. So uh, let me talk a little bit about our own work in really trying to understand light trapping uh, in terms of the uh, optical mode. And uh, to do that, I would uh, illustrate this by a very simple example. Again, you take a two micron thick silicon, you put a grating on top, and then uh, you will get absorption spectrum that's represented by the blue curve as compared to the red curve, which is a single pass absorption. So you see absorption enhancement, you see peak, and that of course comes from wave interference. So uh, the basic idea uh, is really instead of thinking about rays, one really should follow what Eli has done in the beginning paper and think about optical modes in the system and therefore think about the presence of many resonances. So uh, what we do is we start by thinking about the contribution of a single resonance. And to do that, of course, using a single resonance to enhance absorption is a relatively well-known concept. Uh, you have a radio, for example, and if it's on resonance, you have an absorption peak. Now, uh, from a more basic point of view, you can think of resonance characterized by an intrinsic loss rate and an external leakage rate, and the resonance property then is entirely described by the balance of these two rates. So in such a case, it is well known that you can get to a 100% absorption 
at what's called the critical coupling regime where these two rates balance each other. So the traditional use of resonance for absorption enhancement, for example, in photo detector kind of application, almost exclusively use the critical coupling regime. But uh, one important point here is to realize that uh, solar cell is in general not a simple photo detector. And the essential point from a wave optics perspective is that the instant spectral bandwidth is much larger compared with the width of the individual peak. So consequently, one really shouldn't be looking at the absorption coefficient of a single frequency and instead should integrate over the entire frequency range. And in doing so, what you can do is to define what's called a spectral cross-section that integrates the absorption as a, over the frequency. And once you have that, you can divide that by the bandwidth to get the absorption contribution of a single resonance to broadband absorption enhancement. So using this, you will quickly see that in fact the optimum is what's called the overcoupling regime, where the outcoupling rate completely dominate over the incoupling rate. That's a case where the peak absorption is actually way below 100%, but the bandwidth enhancement far outweigh the loss of peak absorption rate. And this is in fact consistent with the ergodic limit, limit that Eli outlined, essentially roughen the surface in a very drastic way is a way to very efficiently couple light out of the solar cell into free space. And that's precisely from a resonance picture in this overcoupling limit. So uh, we have argued that you need to use, of course, many resonances to cover the entire solar spectrum. Again, a concept that's certainly not foreign from the radio days. So uh, what you would need to do is to sum over the contribution of the resonances and sum over the spectral cross-section in the mathematical language is to sum over the spectral cross-section of all these resonances. And one very last thing uh, is to realize, of course, that if you put roughness here or you put a large period grating, you will have multiple plane waves that can be generated when a plane wave is instant from the normal direction. So uh, in which case, the spectral cross-section of individual resonance is actually reduced by the number of channels. So with this, you could put in a theory of nanophotonic light trapping, or really think about these nanophotonic structures. And this is a theory that describes the property of free space in terms of number of plane wave channels. It describes the cell in terms of number of resonances. And then from this, you can calculate the maximum absorption of light trapping enhancement and you get a formula like this, and the important quantity, just as Eli uh, very initially pointed out, is the density of state, is the number of resonances divided by the frequency spacing. And the other important property is that the free space show up in this formula in terms of number of channels. So once we have developed this, the first thing we do, of course, is to try to reproduce one square limit. And uh, this you can actually relatively easily do in this kind of construction. Uh, you go to a conventional limit where the periodicity is much larger than the wavelengths, the thickness much larger than the wavelengths. Then you can easily count the number of cyst, number of modes in the cell, and you can count the number of channels in free space, and you run the formula, and you can get four n square. So in doing so, you can construct a theory, therefore, that's entirely free from any ray tracing concept. And everything here is in terms of the properties, some of the intrinsic properties of the optical modes and the free space radiation channels. So uh, moreover, uh, this gives you, from a wave perspective, one of the intuition about the 4 square limit. The enhancement factor scales as the number of resonances divided by the thickness of the film. Now in the conventional limit, if you double the thickness of the film, you double the resonance, number of resonances. So these two actually cancel. So the nice thing about 4 square is that it's independent of geometry. On the other hand, once you understood this, of course, you can realize that if you go to nanophotonic regime and you can do nanoscale modal confinement over broad bandwidths, then you can decouple the number of resonances from the thickness of the film. 
and in which case you will have a possibility to go beyond the full n score limit. And uh, so uh, this is something as a toy example of a numerical example that uh, what we did is we put a, a relatively low index light absorption layer uh, below a high index light scattering layer. And in doing that, it created a mode that looked like this for an electric field that's perpendicular to the film where the field is very strongly confined in the low index layer. And this is actually a purely electrostatic effect. It's something called slot wave guide effect. And uh, as a result, it's basically frequency independent. So uh, once you run the theory that we develop, you realize that in this system, you can get to an enhancement factor of about 60 N score. And this is what we see uh, numerically. The gray line here is the uh, single pass absorption. The red curve here is the 4 N score limit. And the blue curve here is the enhancement factor inside the structure. And you can see that the enhancement is above 4 N score for every single wavelength that you scan. It is also above 4 N score, actually, for every single angle that you looked at. So uh, with that, uh, uh, a, let me uh, very quickly conclude. Uh, the discovery of the 4 N square limit uh, really has had a very great influence in practical uh, optical solar cell design, especially in crystalline silicon optical solar cell design. Moreover, uh, some of the basic understanding that leading to 4 N square, in particular, the thinking about the thermodynamics of light uh, uh, is very important and certainly has inspired many of the current work, including our own, in thinking about uh, solar cells beyond the ray optics limits in the nanophotonic regime. So with that, let me thank you for your attention. And thanks, Eli, for introducing the subject. Right, that's the number of channels. So in fact, uh, in the case, of, um, uh, in the case uh, of a grating design, when the number of channels is restricted, you can go beyond 4 and square for a range of angles as well. So it come out there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm a little shocked uh, by this and embarrassed because I've told many people over the years that surely thermodynamics would limit you to the 4 and squared limit. Um, uh, if, if you have to include all incident angles. Um, have you done a sort of thermodynamic look at this? How, how does thermodynamics play into this modal density uh, approach? Uh, this is precisely uh, the uh, thermodynamics. So it's actually no different from the uh, uh, detail balance argument that Eli I see. The, the only difference is that uh, what goes into thermodynamics is the density of the mode. And yeah. so if you have a very drastic change of the density of mode over broadband, things will be different. I see, I see. So I apologize to anyone here I've told that to in the past. <laughs> Too technical question, but is there a reason why, in your numerical work, you have a circularly symmetric structure as opposed to a translationally invariant? Oh structure? no, uh, it is a, a grating. So this is a single period of the grating, uh, and it's a square lattice of these gratings. Okay. Just to make sure that uh, gets across. The important point are that the grating periods are larger than the wavelengths, free space wavelengths, to give you uh, all angle response, and the direction. Uh, of these groups are put in by Zhong Fu Yu. He really dreamed this up to uh, uh, ensure that all polarizations get scattered equally.